Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. I wouldn't say necessarily that I have two identities that I'm walking the path between two worlds. I put myself in one world, but everybody else puts me in another. A lot of the things I do are an effort to declare myself and who I am so that others know where I stand. I'm Talon Wilson. I come from the Upper Sioux community in southwest Minnesota. I'm currently studying at a handwork school in Sweden. The school I go to is called uh, Sæteglentan. It has four main focuses that you can choose from. It has blacksmithing, it has woodworking, it has sewing, and it has weaving. I'm currently studying as a blacksmith. I have studied as a woodworker for two years, and I'm gonna be continuing my study for at least one, if not two more years. Within blacksmithing, it's lots of traditional things, especially in Sweden. There's also lots of room for students to personalize their own experience. For some, that is very much focused on tradition, tools, and history. And for others, it's much more artistic, and they take it in in very different directions. So going to Sweden has definitely put me on more of an artistic path. When I went there, I had no intention whatsoever of participating in the more artistic side of the school. I was going there for the traditional handcrafts, I was going to make tools, that was going to be it. Then having been on the school and working with people of different backgrounds, being around them has made me really appreciate art in a completely different way than I have in the past. Aesthetically pleasing and beautiful things are really starting to become more integrated into what I want to do. So I started with the Milan Village Art School when I was 13 years old. It was first John Royson's uh, basic knife making class and then Gene Tokheim and John Royson's uh, advanced knife making class. And I think I did that, if I remember right, six years in a row and kept going and hanging out with those guys and making knives every year and getting progressively better with that. Ever since I was a little kid, I was interested in that kind of stuff. And so the opportunity was fantastic to go to learn at this school. I mean, without them, I would not be at Glenton. What was frustrating was with the Milan School of Village Arts and the North House Folk School is that they are small. You can take a weekend course or a week-long course in whatever you want. You have all these options, but that's not how you truly become a master of something. You really have to dedicate yourself, and so I basically just went around asking the teachers at both schools where I could go. My original intention was actually to see if I could get an apprenticeship with someone, but 
being a craftsperson is not that lucrative a business and so unfortunately quite unrealistic nowadays to have an apprentice. It costs too much money and time to train someone in until they're up to the point where they can produce under you. The one thing everyone came back with when I asked was the name Sätterglänton in Sweden. And so I with my prior knowledge of Sweden exists and I knew what IKEA was, I looked up the school, signed up, packed my bags and left. As a Dakota person, that is a very heavy influence in my life <laughs> and decision making. Unfortunately, when I was quite young, we moved away. We moved to Arizona and lived there for seven years, and I was quite separated from Dakota culture as a whole, really. Um, we had some experiences, but not really enough to really kind of grow into that. When I came back, I jumped as much as I could into what I could. I was taking language classes, I was participating in the youth camps and programs, um, I was learning as much as I could, but it was a struggle to keep up with the kids who've been dancing since they were four years old and learning, trying to learn the language and stuff like that, but I did my best. And so one of the things as a craftsperson that I'm trying to do is kind of rediscover what Dakota crafts are, what Dakota crafts look like, what Dakota design looks like. Part of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take these ideas and essentially evolve my understanding of the culture, my growing understanding of the culture, and incorporate it into what I do. One of the things that is really scary about trying to do this is the fact that, I mean, Culturally speaking, we have lost so much. There is so much culture that is just gone. It will never come back because there's no one who can bring it back, really. Another one of the things that I struggle with, personally, is the issue of cultural appropriation. The idea of taking something without any cultural perspective or influence or knowledge is a really scary thing. I mean, especially spiritually speaking, taking things out of context can be a really dangerous thing. That being said, I'm in Sweden studying for Dakota people two very non-traditional crafts. And so part of my struggle, every time I try and sit down and design something even, where am I drawing that line? How much am I taking from traditional Scandinavian culture? My life has evolved quite a lot after taking this journey to Sweden. When I got there, I was 18 years old. I had never lived by myself before, never traveled by myself before, never been to a country where a different language was spoken um, as the primary language. It was really intense. I mean, within that first year, I grew up a lot. I learned a lot about, I mean, what it is to be or well, at least start being an adult. I learned what it is to be a craftsperson. I began learning to what it is to be an artist. I mean, I was an outspoken 18 year old, but I was very quiet within social settings and moving to another country, having to make friends in order to survive has really helped me grow socially as a person in ways I never thought I would. One of the issues I've had to deal with just about all my life growing up around a native community is the fact that I don't look native. I consider myself Dakota, but there's always been an effort to prove myself to other people. As messed up as a thing that can be, I mean, I actually felt that it was very 
positive experience for me personally. It's not for everyone. But I was able to grow a lot through that as well because it pushed me and it motivated me in different directions where otherwise I may not have been interested or uh, participated in things I would never have even seen. And so part of this crafts thing that I'm doing is a declaration of who I am. In my future, what I want for myself is when people see my work, they can identify that it's me. And to a certain degree, at the very least, I want them to be able to identify that I am Dakota, I am a Dakota person, I have these values, and I want that to shine through my craft. Never thought that I'd be here Playing around in this field Keeping hope and fighting fear Prairie grass for a spear My dreams for a shield Well, what you're seeing tonight is, uh, been, is a culmination of a months-long process of a series of story swaps, uh, extensive work in the archives, gathering stories, interviewing people, recruiting actors, musicians. It's an original, creative production, uh, but it didn't happen overnight. So uh, there's been many months of behind-the-scenes work involved in this. What has been so exciting about this particular show that's different than other place-based shows is that we're really trying to unite an entire county. So we're starting to think more regionally, being able to highlight the unique perspectives of each of the four communities that we're playing with, um, but also being able to kind of find the commonalities between these places and what really unites them. And being able to stage this production all over these beautiful landscapes has been such a gift. We're looking at this county through the lens of four towns, Parker's Prairie, Purim, Battle Lake, and Pelican Rapids. And we've gotten to know residents from those four towns very well. We set up a sort of a coffee shop gathering and, and collect the stories of uh, folks from the county that have been here a long time or had some colorful stories to share and, and then just use everyday Otter Tail County residents to tell the, the history of the county. Well, we don't live in a microcosm, so I think our puppet show should be about all of Otter Tail County. Agreed. How far into the future should we create? How about 150 years? Well, that's a long time from now. We'll be dead. Yes but it will be an important year for the county. Sesquicentennial! <laughs> the Historical Society is so good and they played along so well, but sitting in those story swaps and hearing how people wanted to make sure we told that story, that their story. They, they worked so hard in getting the history of the county and the location so well, and my favorite part is that Fergus isn't a part of it. Everything always happens in Fergus Falls. And so Fergus finally gets to be the villain. And I think that's why I love that scene so much, is that I'm like, I'm stealing the seat and you guys are just evil. It was the craftiest win. In the dark of night, they got a posse of kin. Snuck down to Otter Tail and I ain't kidding. They took that county seat back with them. Not everybody is a historian, so we use song and dance and comedy and puppets and other theatrical means as wild as we can get to like to open up people's minds to the significance of their history. I think through the imagination, 
we can get people to think about their surroundings and their past and their future in a whole different way. I think it's the best way to teach the history because even the actors in the show were like, I'm not really history people, but I learned so much about the county they all grew up in. That's a big, uh, a big part of play space is they make history come to life. And so we can play people in history and it's been a lot of fun. Sounds like you've never read the Bible. Hannah Kemper! I didn't know about Hannah Kemper. Like Hannah Kemper. Hannah Kemper. When I originally got the role, it's just like, oh, you know, that's somebody that's important to the county and I didn't really think that much about it, but a fellow church member handed me a book that was part of her autobiography, and I sat down and read that, and that character became real for me. In 1923, I joined the House of State, the first to be elected as a woman till that date. For six I learned so many things. I learned that Purim did turtle races. I didn't know that before. I think you'll be the bowling man in the county. Can you stop fighting now? All of the puppets that we made are people that lived, except for Pelican Pete. That was interesting to um, find out that there were, in this play, actual people that actually lived. I have done a lot of plays, and I love acting. And then when I figured out it was about history, then I loved it even more. And ere the sun had reached the western horizon, laid the foundation for the first permanent settlement in Ardetail County on the shores of beautiful Lake Clitheral. I continue to be amazed at the creativeness of Ashley and Andrew. Andrew's ability to uh, write the script, to uh, boil down so much history into you know, a few scenes here and in some dialogue and in lyrics is you know, just amazing. And to pull this all together like they have done for this original creative production, is, that's what amazes me. They wrote an entire song with 95 fishing lakes, and it works. Like, I love that song. Pine Marion, Dent Lake, Rush Lake from a canoe. A leaf Lake, Pickerel, Tamarack, Turtle, Paul, Battlestar, Silent as Spirit or Loon. Ten Miles, Silver Wall, Clear Lost, Clitheral, Devil's Deer, Eagle, Fisher, Burger, and Bass. Twin Lake, Civil Swan, Adley, if you can sing this any faster, you can fish my... Stewart. The biggest thing was that they said no experience required because I'm not professional at all, but I really enjoy playing. And so um, based on that experience, I had such a good time. I really wanted to make sure that me and my family, I have three kids in the, in the play as well. Uh, I wanted to make sure that they had that experience as well. I do like talking to everybody, like hanging out with people, getting to know people. Like, I didn't know most of these people because they all lived in different towns. And then one stop further, you got to know them, and everybody was a bit more comfortable around each other. We have every town that we are performing in represented, in addition, multiple other towns as well uh, represented in our cast and they have driven seriously hundreds of miles to be a part of this show which just shows the dedication and commitment to the community spirit and pride and you know willingness to jump in both feet and get very involved in creating a better future for this county. Uh, you know, I'm 66, soon to be 67 years old, and, and virgin experiences are few and far between for an old guy. So this was a virgin experience for me. It, it's nice. Uh, you know, I don't believe we should always do things the way we've 
always done them just because that's the way we've done them. And I think in a lot of ways, people say, oh, I can't do theater, I couldn't act because I don't have a voice that's big enough or I'm not a good dancer or, you know, because you look at me and you say, okay, that's not a dancer's body. Uh, and, and it's not a dancer's body. But no one, no one said, oh, you can't dance. Already just talking to a few people that I know that have attended have just said, we are really become a part of the, 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 the theater. We've become part of the scene. And that is what they've really taken back with it. And that's what they've really, really enjoyed that we've participated in the production with you. When I've told people, okay, and you're gonna wanna bring a chair because you're gonna move. What? Oh, so you're gonna do a scene and then we're gonna do a scene and then we're gonna do a scene and then we're gonna be done. And then we're gonna go to another town. And they're like, a different show? And I went, nope, same show, different spots. There is nothing traditional about it, which I think is, if you're used to traditional theater, it's a little weird but it's so much fun. It Fishing opener, woo! Sorry about her. She's been drinking Mountain Dew since 6 a.m. this morning. You know, any time you can share a story instead of just looking at facts and statistics and things like that, I, I think it really brings it home and, and really takes it to the heart, straight to the heart, and, and be able to uh, maybe relate better to where we come from in, in looking at the stories, telling it through today's people. This is uh, storytelling at its finest. It's, it will engage people. People will understand the stories from their communities. It's not a dry lecture, an academic lecture, some sitting passively in a hall while someone shows a PowerPoint. It's interactive, uh, it's moving, it's original. We're telling real stories from Otter Tail County history. This is about their town, their county their history. When I, the first quarter that I was on campus, it almost had a high schoolish kind of feel to it. I mean, all the students were young and in lower division. I remember the student senate had proposed a student dress code. Students had hours, you know, the visitation hours in the dorm. And then suddenly it was like all of that got swept away. We went to co-ed housing. I was part of an effort that organized the first co-ed house on campus. We got rid of curfews for women. The politics that was sweeping the nation started taking hold on campus. And very quickly, people were turning against the war. I was one of 166 uh, people arrested during that um, uh, demonstration. Um, at the time, I was on the Marshall City Council, so I kind of ended up playing a kind of a pivotal role in that demonstration because the night before the demonstration on campus, there was a big rally and I attended it. And there were some folks that were really trying to whip up the crowd. And the crowd was interested in uh, basically doing some civil disobedience, you know, like a sit down on uh, Main Street. And so 
we formed a little committee and I called um, the police and also the county attorney who was Pat Leary at the time. At first it was kind of confrontational and because they said well, the people wanted to have a sit down, you know, to block traffic. And Captain Davis said, uh, so where do you want to have this? And some students said, well, why should we tell you? And I remember he said, well, it might be a good idea because there might be a redneck semi driver who might want to run over you with an 18 wheeler. Uh, so, you know, we'd like to protect you and direct traffic around that spot. The first sit down was out in front of Eastside Grade School on East College Drive. And they said, that's a long ways to walk, you know, to the, the jail, so we'll have a bus there. And some of the students said, well, I'm not going to get on the bus, you're going to have to carry me. And they said, okay, um, those who want, when we arrest you, we'll tap you on the shoulder. And those who want to be carried on the bus, you, you tell them then. Uh, and otherwise you can get up and walk on the bus, you know, whatever you want. And you know, so, uh, that was pretty peaceful. And they said, um, you know, we'll have cookies and stuff down in the, in the jail, and you can pay your, your, your bail whenever you want. Our, our goal was to, to convince people to be against the war. Um, yes, there were some people that thought we were communists and, you know, communist sympathizers. I had some doors slammed in my face. Uh, but I think most people were, were at a point where they were beginning to tire of the war already anyhow. And so I think we got a better reception than um, we might have otherwise got. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org.